Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about a deep vein thrombosis and then how it ultimately converts to a pulmonary embolism. In the next two videos after this, we'll be talking more about the Wells criteria, each for DVT or APE. Let's start off by talking about what is a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. A DVT is basically a blood clot that forms in the wall of a deep vein, normally in the lower extremity. Okay, so common veins where this will happen will be the femoral vein, um, some of the iliac veins, the popliteal vein, usually medium to large size veins. And they're also usually going to be deep veins, not superficial. So for example, we're not going to expect to see this in the saphenous vein. Okay, so we might expect it in the popliteal vein or the femoral vein. And you can see right here, here's a deep vein, here's the wall of the vein, and we have a blood clot that has formed. This is the DVT. Now what I'm about to say is a relative statement, so don't jump on me for this, but intrinsically a deep vein thrombosis, if it just stays here localized in the wall of this vein, it's not intrinsically that bad. Okay, yes, it occludes blood flow, and that can lead to problems long-term, of course. Um, this sticks into the lumen of the vein, so there's less space for blood to travel, right? So it occludes blood flow. But while it's there, it's not acutely fatal, okay? What becomes problematic is if a portion of this blood clot breaks off and is now free-floating in the blood, okay? And so that's what we're about to see. So these circles here that are dark red, this portion of the DVT, the blood clot, is going to break off. And that process of breaking off is called embolizing. And the resulting fragment that's now floating free in the blood is called an embolus. This embolus literally goes with the flow. It goes wherever the bloodstream takes it. So it's probably going to go up from the lower extremity through the inferior vena cava, ultimately up to the right atrium of the heart. It's going to circulate through the chambers of the heart, so from the right atrium to the right ventricle, and ultimately go up into the uh, pulmonary trunk, as you see right here. So it's going to travel through the circulatory system, ultimately up to the pulmonary trunk. Let's see in detail how that actually works. Again, um, coming from the veins in the lower extremities, it's going to come up through this inferior vena cava, go up to the right atrium. From there, it's going to go through the AV valve on the right side from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And then the right ventricle is going to pump it across the pulmonic or pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. Now remember, the pulmonary trunk bifurcates into a left pulmonary artery. You can see that one right here and a right pulmonary artery that actually goes behind the superior vena cava and the aortic arch. And then each of those arteries branches further as they go into the lungs themselves. So if you have an embolus here that goes from the right ventricle across the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary trunk, it's going to probably go either to the left pulmonary artery or the right pulmonary artery, and it's eventually going to get stuck in one of these branches as these vessels get smaller and smaller and smaller. So this embolus comes up here into the heart, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary trunk. Uh, you could say this is the left pulmonary artery, this is the right pulmonary artery over here. Um, exactly the nature of the arteries doesn't matter here. The point that I'm going to show you is that the embolus has a finite size, and so do the arteries, right, and their branches. So as long as the vessel is wide enough to accommodate the size of the embolus, the embolus will continue to flow. But as you can imagine, as these vessels get smaller and smaller, at some point the embolus is not going to be able to squeeze um, through that vessel. So here, the embolus is small enough, okay? or we could say the vessel is large enough, so the embolus doesn't get stuck there. But once the embolus gets here, it's now too big to go through these smaller arteries, and so it blocks blood flow past these points. It is true that the embolus, if it's large enough, could get stuck at the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk. That's not very common. What is more common is it to get stuck at the bifurcation of the left and the right pulmonary arteries, so basically where these X's are. And so if the pulmonary embolism gets stuck at any of these points, it's going to block blood flow to that part of the lung. That's going to reduce respiratory efficiency, and if it's severe enough, it can lead to death. 
And that's why we want to screen for deep vein thromboses and pulmonary embolisms, because we can't have a pulmonary embolism without a DVT. It's a piece of that DVT that breaks off or embolizes, and that's what goes to the lungs and creates a pulmonary embolism. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of what a DVT is, how it leads to an embolus formation, and how a resulting pulmonary embolism uh, can obstruct blood flow to a portion of the lungs and create problems. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.